Let's give it up for our next headlight tour. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, great. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed the lunch and the performance, and you're all awake and ready for uh, to hear me talk about uh, incorporating cultural and contextual nuances to make the most out of your UX research. So before we dive into this, maybe just I'll very briefly introduce myself. Uh, so I'm born and raised in India. Um, I did my master's in HCI in the US, which is actually how I got into UX research. Um, and worked there for a few years in the US and moved to Singapore, which is where I'm currently based. Uh, I've been a UX researcher for almost seven years now, having uh, led research across different markets in US, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Um, so started my UX journey with Google, where I led research for Google Pixel and more B2B Google Workspace products. Um, came to Singapore, joined Grab, uh, where I led um, consumer research across Southeast Asia on different topics around like getting new users on the platform, loyalty, etc. Um, and now I run my own company uh, where we basically partner with different companies to help them launch and scale consumer products um, across Asia, leveraging user insights. So um, let's dive into uh, the topic for today. So a quick show of hands, how many of you here have run your own user research? OK, there's quite a few. How many of you have run research in a market where you don't speak the local language? OK, there's some. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of what I want to talk about today, is like how do we, uh, A, run research in markets that we are not very familiar with, but also how do we run international research um, and sort of get insights from various markets and make sense of it, right, and help teams make decisions. Um, so I want to start with uh, sharing two case studies. Uh, the first one is actually a talk I heard at a conference in 2018. There were two Facebook researchers presenting, and I want to sh start with sharing this because I think this is what sort of inspired me to want to work in the Asian markets, just given how diverse they are, um, and it, I think eventually led for me to move to Singapore. So at the time, Facebook and now Meta, they were working on the Facebook Lite app, right, which is the lighter version of their Facebook app for users who are on lower bandwidth or low-end phones, and they wanted to come do some design evaluation for that app. So now what they saw was that while uh, India is not majorly an English-speaking language, uh, English-speaking country, so, but the device language tends to be English more often. So the numbers don't, didn't really add up. While there's not that many people speaking English, but the number of people using their devices in English was pretty high. So as they started doing the research, they realized that people don't look at like the text or the labels while they're trying to navigate the app. They just remember the placement on the phone, right? So they know that if I click on the bottom left corner, this happens, irrespective of what that label says, because that's in English and a lot of people cannot read it. So that was interesting because it meant now that they have to be very careful about making design changes. I can't just move around something uh, because that's going to make the users feel very lost, right? Suddenly they don't know where do I go find the same thing that was here before. And onboarding tooltips is not going to help because they can't read what's on there. So I think, uh, to me, this felt like a classic case of really going deeper into specific markets, specific types of users, and understanding their context and their culture, right? Uh, had this been done, let's say, in the US, it would have just been a normal user testing. Or even like tier one cities in India, it would have just been, for English speaking users, a normal usability test. But because they went to specific tier three markets, non-English speaking users, uh, understanding the analytics around like, okay, what's the language they're speaking, what's the device language, etc., is when it started to become a more interesting story, which actually, uh, you know, helped them make really uh, good decision leading to business impact. Um, a second and the last one I want to share in terms of the case study is from my personal experience at Grab. So we were working on a product to launch family account on Grab. So you can add your family members, book rights for them, 
share payment methods, monitor rides, etc. And the marketing team wanted to sort of market this product primarily to parents, saying, hey, you can send your kids to school. You know, it's a safe, nice car, uh, well-trained drivers, and uh, you can monitor, and it saves you time. Now, as we started talking to users in Indonesia, we realized that the parents were actually more reluctant to send kids to school in cars, but they were more open to do so on a two-wheeler. Surprising, right? Um, because, yeah, I mean, I think we were all very surprised when we heard that. The reason is that they felt if the kid's on a two-wheeler and they feel anything's unsafe, the driver's going in the wrong direction, the kid can just yell and get attention from anyone on the road because the roads are so crowded, there are so many other people on the two-wheelers, or he can just get down the two-wheeler at a stop or whatever. Versus if the kid is in the car, the windows are closed, and they want to you know, get attention for help, it's going to be so much harder for the kid to do that. So this insight really helped the marketing team figure out the best way we were going to market this specific feature in Indonesia, right? It, it wasn't going to be similar to Singapore, where the, where the kid's going in the school in a car and everything's fine, because it's a much safer country. But in, in Indonesia, it's slightly different in terms of safety, but also just the dynamics on the road, right? There's just so much happening, it's so crowded that it's easier for the kid to get attention. So um, now that we know why it's important to consider these uh, contextual cultural uh, details when we are running research and using those insights in our product, um, let's look at how we can set ourselves up to do so, right? Especially when we are running research in a market we don't know the language uh, or it's just a generally new market for us. Um, so let's start with uh, just uh, you know, being prepared, planning, and making space for surprises. Again, you don't know much about the market, you don't speak the language. Each market has very specific characteristics, very specific challenges, and so no matter what, you're going to come across insights that are going to surprise you. And so it's always nice to be sort of prepared for it. Um, and again, it sounds sort of obvious, but it's super important to just leave your assumptions behind when you go into these research studies, especially assumptions about the West and assumptions about big metro cities, right? It's very common for us to think because something's worked in the West, it's going to work in any other market here and just copy paste it. Um, so again, just to share an example, uh, this is a screenshot from the Grab app uh, and it's basically showing one restaurant. And when we were running a research in Indonesia, what we saw was users didn't understand what the dollar signs meant. They had literally no idea what it meant. Um, and if you think about it, obviously so, because dollar isn't even their currency, right? They don't know what it means. So even now, when you see Google Maps, they give you a range. Even in India, it says 200 to 400 rupees. So it kind of gives you a sense of how much I'm spending, versus this is just super abstract. Or even things like 4.2 stars, 472 ratings, surprising, but users didn't know what it meant. A lot of them thought it's like 4.7 kilometers away from home or whatever. So they just ignored that section of the tile and, you know, were just looking at all of the other information that's there. So it's, like I said, very important that, you, that we leave behind the assumptions we have just because we understand a certain design pattern doesn't mean everybody else does. Um, another uh, interesting example was... Um, uh, while we were running some research in Thailand with some, th with some drivers, again with Grab, um, and we were running research where we were showing maps and specific alerts of like, oh, there's an accident, traffic, and one of the alert was bumpy roads ahead. Uh, again, with the team sitting in Singapore, we were like, yeah, this is great, you know, everybody wants to know if there's a bumpy road, maybe avoid, maybe get prepared for it. And the drivers in Thailand told us, uh, oh, this isn't really helpful because have you seen the roads in Bangkok? They're all bumpy, everywhere. So what am I going to do with this, right? Like, it, it's going to pop up every minute or what? So yes, you show it to me when it's really severe and I really need to change course, but otherwise it's not very useful. Um, one other way to sort of keep check of your assumptions is always taking a step back and framing your research questions more broadly. So instead of saying something like, how do we redesign this page? to better help our users. Maybe think about, okay, how are users currently even making decisions, right? And what role does review play in it? So we are flipping from question about the feature, 
how do I design, what do I do with my feature, because we can get too obsessed about it, we are working on it. But take a step back and make the question about the user itself, right? Then it helps you think about the user behavior a bit more. And now you've opened up the scope of the question to get some more insights about user behavior rather than just focusing on the design itself. Um, okay, the next point is around collecting reliable data. Um, and how do we do so in a way that we're getting data that's um, not just reliable, but also is helping us get great insights. Um, the first piece is around collaborating with local moderators and translators. Um, when you can, I know this comes at a cost, but at least from my experience, I've known that it's well worth the cost. Um, a, because it gives you access to non-English speaking users, especially in a market that's not predominantly English speaking, because uh, again, if you're only speaking to English speaking users in such a market, you're talking to a very small percentage of your users who aren't representative of the entire market. These local moderators, translators can also help you contextualize your insights. Right? So sometimes you may hear something from a participant which to you as a foreigner for the, that place wouldn't make sense. They'll help you sort of bridge that gap on why this person's saying this and where are they really coming from. And of course, needless to say, um, there are certain markets where people are a bit shy or they aren't as vocal. And so when they're talking to their local people, they are at a lot more ease than they are when they talk to someone who's from outside. It just, puts, just scares them a little bit. So like, there's a lot of advantage of uh, finding great local partners and working with them. Um, the other thing is around taking the liberty to tweak your interview questions as you go through your research and find new findings or new insights. Um, traditionally, we think of research as oh, you have to ask the same set of questions to all the 10 users because that's the right, most scientific approach of doing things. But what I've realized is it doesn't work in an industry context. So it doesn't work in this specific context where you don't know the market so well because you've gone in with a set of questions which you phrased, framed based on your assumptions. But very quickly, maybe you start to realize after one to two interviews, hey, these questions aren't working. Like, it, they, they just don't make sense, right? Your assumptions are falling flat. And so as you get those insights, feel free to tweak them in your other interviews. Let's say eight, one to two interviews, you find something, you tweak it. Um, it'll just help you get the most out of that research rather than asking some of those repetitive questions which are not giving you much uh, data. Um, and then finally, um, again, this is something I've realized after moving to Singapore and you know, working more in the Southeast Asian markets is it really helps to test for articulation when you're screening your participants. Um, I think in the West, people generally are more vocal, they're more opinionated, and they're more ready to share feedback, versus that may not always be the case here. And so how many times has it happened where you've sat in an interview, you're asking questions, you get these one word answer, one sentence answer, you know, it's, it's a waste of ta your time, it's a waste of your stakeholders time if they're joining in. So, you know, I, I just like to pick a, um, a situation like, hey, tell me about the last time you ordered food, share as much detail as you can, right? Maybe they're just typing it out, but it just gives you a sense of how articulate they are and you don't end up being in a situation where you're not getting much out of your research session. Um, and then finally, uh, of course, now that we've you know, uh, planned our research well, we've collected reliable data, uh, how do we analyze uh, the data that we have more from this cultural, contextual lens? Um, and I think again here, sort of tying back to the point I just made, is being cognizant of the varying levels of vocal feedback you'll get in different cultures, right? So there will be times where the same feedback from very different markets can mean different things and very different feedback from, the, from different markets can mean the same things. So what I mean is there will be markets where somebody like somebody doesn't like your feature, they'll be very upfront about it. Hey, this isn't something that's useful for someone, someone like me. Versus in certain markets where people are traditionally a little bit more polite, they may, some, they may say, hey, it's actually okay, but uh, maybe it's useful for someone who isn't tech savvy, right? So again, it's meaning the same thing. It's, it's pointing to the same thing, but it's said in very different ways. So whenever you're looking at feedback, make sure you're looking at where it's coming from and 
What does it mean in that specific context of the market? Um, also, if somebody loves your product, in certain markets, people are very excited, you know, like, hey, this is amazing, I could use it in these X, Y, Z instances, versus in other markets, it can come, even if they are excited, it's very muted. It's like, yeah, it's really nice, it's good to understand. So in these situations, I think it helps to ask good follow-up questions, just, you know, especially in markets where the feedback is a little bit less vocal, I'd say. So, hey, it's easy to understand, great, like what parts are easy to understand, why do you say so, etc. right? So you can always uh, make sure you're asking good, feed, good follow-up questions in order to get to what does this feedback really mean. Um, I think that's all I have. So just as a way to recap, um, you know, leave uh, your assumptions behind, um, make space for surprises, fr uh, frame broader research questions, Collaborate with the local partners whenever you can. Um, don't worry or don't feel guilty or hesitant about tweaking your interview questions as you go along your research and as you gather new insights. Uh, test for articulation to screen your participants just so you're getting, again, the most of the time that you're putting into the research. Um, and then be cognizant of the varying levels of vocal feedback in different cultures. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. This is my company website. I also post some stuff on Instagram, like really short things. So if you're like into social media, I post stuff about UX research. So you can follow me there as well. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Kanika. Great talk, by the way. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Yeah. I had one point to kind of add on what you said, the critical user versus product. What I have seen in some of the research that I have conducted is the participant kind of doesn't want to hurt you yeah. on what you're saying, right? And you ask, like, hey, is a good design? They say, hi, it's good. Huh. But they know it's shit, yeah. right? So how do you make sure that they're not saying something to make you feel good at the research yeah. on the spot? How do you handle the situation? Like that? Yeah, I think there's different ways of looking at it. One, whenever you start an interview, you want to establish that as a baseline, right, in terms of like, hey, the goal of this is to get feedback. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Uh, you're not, yeah, I think like, please be as candid as you can because that's what the goal is. So just making that very explicit early on, I think helps and saying it like a little, you know, in a humorous way. So they, I think it just helps build that rapport as well. And then I think if they say, hey, this is a great design, like just ask a lot of follow-up questions, right? And then if they're able to articulate why they think it's a great design, great. Then I think that points to the fact that it's working. But if they aren't, if they still keep giving you these very generic answers, or oh, looks nice, whatever, then again, you know that they're saying it, but they're not really meaning it, right? So you don't have to take the word for it. Or if they can't come up with specific use cases where they can use it, then you know that they're just saying it, it's an, it's an assumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Kanika. Yeah. Um, this may be a very broad question, but uh, how do you figure out certain nuances with certain cultures? Like, for example, I've done research with uh, Chinese participants, and they are very hesitant to provide any kind of feedback. So they will just um, say, yeah, OK, sounds good. Can we yeah. move on? Yeah. Um, so how do you sort of recognize that, yes, in this culture, I'm going to find, I, I need to dig more or some other kind of nuance. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So again, I think it just comes down to your moderation skills, right, in terms of asking the right follow-up question, even if they're like, yeah, this is okay. Maybe try to understand where that's coming from, right? And I think that in itself will give you some answers into is it, is it related to culture, is it context, is it something else, is it just them individually, uh, or it's a broader theme, right? So I think it comes down to my go-to in those situations is just asking great follow-up questions and like getting deep down to understand why is it that they're giving you that specific type of feedback. Uh, and that in itself will start showing you if it's what is it related to or where are they coming from. Yeah. Can I ask <laughs> when you go into a, uh, an interview, before that, are you able to identify certain cultural nuances? And if so, how do you do that? Yeah. Uh, I think look at like, I, I, I think a lot, doing a lot of secondary research helps. 
so if you've never worked in that market before, if somebody else in your company has, maybe look at their research insights, but also just doing a lot of secondary research and understanding, okay, what do I need to know about this market before I go in? And I think that's where, like, I think yesterday's talk pointed to how you can use even AI to do that, right? Like, what are some key things I need to know before I start diving, or about a specific topic and a market? So then that helps you at least have some baseline. Then you're going in and asking more questions and getting more insights. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 